we talked a little bit about last time and finished up with the mobilization effort um, and how we kind of, again, through um, the Sedition, Espionage, and Sabotage Act, kind of suspended people's liberties. And because of that, we limited their free speech, what they could or could not say against the war. And the state of the war in 1917. So the Bolshe Bolshevik Revolution, their Communist Revolution, um, you have the Treaty of Bessalopstock, and you have the French Army in Mutiny. So people were not happy at this point. Italians were in full retreat, and Germany suffering warfare improved. So in 1917, the war was going exactly how um, the Axis wanted. All right. The United, or the United States, again, was neutral at this point, and there were a bunch of countries kind of on the run, tired, and we see, again, the U.S. is not involved at this point. And we're not going to get two in the war in Europe, because, again, this is U.S. history, um, but if we look at the battles and the offensives, we see how Germany is pushing towards France, um, and eventually Germany in World War II does get there and totally takes over France. Um, so within 19... Months of 1917, um, you had the convoy defeated the submarines. Um, the fresh U.S. troops drove Germans all the way to the border. And the reason the German they were able to again just come in and kind of um, push the war in the favor of the Allies was this is such a ravage, uh, ravage war. Um, you had trench warfare where people in trenches for months. They take six months to maybe gain a couple feet in the trenches in the area in between. And there was no man's land, which I will show you. If you've ever seen the movie Wonder Woman, I'm going to attach a clip that has the um, scene in Wonder Woman where she crosses no man's land. So in no man's land, there was barbed wire, crossfire, landmines. Um, and again, it was completely wide open. You know, it would have been insane to think that someone could run across it. Um, and the Wonder Woman clip I'm going to attach will show you that. It's obviously a movie and funny. But it gets the same point home of what that area looked like. Um, it was muddy. It was just a very depressing war. Um, the most famous story from the war was, you know, on Christmas Day, the truce um, between Ger the Allies and the Axis, where they had Christmas together. Um, that was one of the more famous stories told about this war. And again, it was a very deadly war because people were not used to fighting with this type of technology. Um, remember, the last major war, Spanish-American War, wasn't really you know, was the, the U.S. Civil War, and the, the fighting style was so much different. And at this point in time, the machinery all kind of advanced to that point. And this leads me to the next point, casualties. Russia, 1.7 million. Germany, 1.8 million. France, 1.35, or 385 million. England, almost a million. Austria, all over a million. U.S., only at 112. And I say that only, but relatively speaking, to, towards what everyone else had to deal with. Nearly wiped out an entire generation of European men. If we look at that and you add up Germany, France, and England, you know, that's all 3.2, almost four, over 4 million people who, you know, were casualties of the war. And again, just comparatively speaking, Germany and Russia were willing to sustain the most casualties, um, and Ger Germany really take a, took a hit. And Germany is not doing well after the war, economically, just in general. Um, and that void, that kind of, the fact we beat down Germany with the, the treaties after, um, all spurred the nationalism, which eventually led Adolf, Adolf Hitler to rise in power. I was intensified by the crowd conditions on the battlefield, train camps, and troops. The flu pandemic killed over half a million Americans and 21 people worldwide. Um, last year, I remember I was teaching just about this, um, when COVID-19 hit. Um, so again, obviously there were a lot of factors during World War II that made the flu a kind of a catalyst for the death. The living conditions, obviously people crowd together, the poverty, um, all these kind of, if you think about the precautions we're taking, imagine if we were in a World War, World War um, and we had the COVID-19 pandemic going. So again, the influenza pandemic um, killed over half a million Americans and so 21 people worldwide. It hit at the perfect time during the war where countries were, again, fighting a war. They were stuck in trenches together. Um, and that was why the casualty was so high with 21 million people. How are you going to keep them down on the farm after a seen me? And this was, again, a, uh, a band leader who um, James Rich Europe went out to become a French lieutenant. 
commanding a machine gun, and he saw frontline action. He and other black musicians were reassigned to present musical entertainment behind the lines, becoming among the first jazz players in France. Upon returning to the United States in 1919, he and his band recorded How You Gonna Keep Him Down on the Farm After They've Seen Paris. Many groups record this popular song, but black musicians have given it a different emphasis. To this. How can black soldiers be kept down after experiencing less oppressive racial patterns in France? And that was something they left and they came back to the United States with. So the war is over. How did Woodrow Wilson, okay, what was his plan to never have another world war? And we obviously know he failed um, miserably in that regard, but he had a 14 point plan. It was fair, open peace, perpetual freedom of the seas, elimination of protective tariffs. Protective tariffs were not good for other countries. Um, he wanted to reduce armaments to bare minimum and redraw the map of Europe along ethnic lines. The League of Nations was his most pivotal point. Um, Wilson wanted the League of Nations more than anything else, which, again, it's the precursor to the United Nations we have today. But the Allies wanted more. They wanted revenge. So again, Wilson, all he wanted was his League of Nations. He thought that would stop the war. But... Again, most people were very upset with Germany, and they really wanted to put Germany down. Um, despite the United States' is late at the end of the war, remember Wilson, who campaigned on the fact that um, we wouldn't be in war, thought that he could dictate the terms of peace. His optimism is contrasted here by a more chastened look by the French president. So again, while he's excited, um, the French president obviously has different body language going on. And if we look right here, you have Wilson, George Clemenceau, and David Lloyd George are among the central figures in this painting called the Signing of the Treaty of Versailles. It was called the Treaty of Versailles because it was at the it was signed at the famous palace in France. The gathered statements appear dwarfed by their surroundings. Um, so again, the Treaty of Versailles was what effectively ended the war and did not do a good job um, settling peace. Germany lost all its overseas colonies. They reduced the German army to 100,000. And the same steps um, were done to Japan were the fact that Japan had their army abolished, um, the German Navy abolished. France was given exploitation rights. Alsace-Lorraine, they were given 10 years. Okay, and Saar Basin, 15. Now, Alsace-Lorraine is a pivotal part of World War II and Germany wanting to get it back. Eastern, Eastern Germany was used to create Poland, so Poland was not a country. And again, um, when we get to World War II, Poland was... Hitler made it a point to take back Poland. And you have the war guilt clause. And that was Germany was 100% to blame. The reparations include $56 billion. So there's no way after getting, going to war and getting, um, you know, just, again, decimated, that Germany had any way to pay back $56 billion. It's like if you told a kid, gave a kid on a zero on a test and said, hey, you know, you can never pass this class. You know, the same thing. Germany was given almost, you know, a death sentence to success. And what I mean by that is they had their land taken. They had to pay up the same reparations. They were just decimated, um, and they fell into a deep recession. And during this recession, Adolf Hitler um, was able to use nationalism. Okay? He was saying, hey, we're Germany. We want to create a new right, a new reign. And people were getting behind this um, because, again, German morale was so bad at this time, and the United Nations went above and beyond to punish them. They made no way to make amends. And the ratification struggle. You had no senators, no prominent Republicans at Versailles. Right? So it wasn't like a U.S.-led effort. It was kind of like an oligarchical type meeting. Article 10 of the League of Nations could call out troops. Wilson couldn't compromise. He went to the people. Okay, Wilson eventually suffered a stroke. And the Treaty of Versailles was never actually approved by the United States. And despite the crown jewel of Wilson's peace effort, the U.S. never joined the League of Nations. All right, so again, think about that. We never joined the League of Nations. We never ratified the Treaty of Versailles. The lack of congruency between Europe and the United States was jarring when you think about it. And again, it just totally sets the stage for the war. Um, and the world would never be the same again. All the shifting lands in Europe, redrawing the lines, um, again, allowed the vacuum of German morale and Hitler to eventually become to power. You know, it, the question always is, you know, what did 
what did we do to prevent Hitler and Germany from, you know, finishing what they started in World War One? And the answer is we really never did. We just kind of moved on. Um, you know, we came into the Roaring Twenties. You know, and during this time period, you know, we were really, um, you know, kind of ob oblivious to what was going on in Germany. Um, and the Allies again did not handle it well. You know, we came in the war late, and we were the pivotal force to push them over the edge. And at the same time, you know, we did not really have much say. Wilson um, might have been too strong-headed in what he wanted out of this, uh, and we didn't have really a huge joint U.S. buy-in effort because of that. So again, all these factors um, after the war and the Treaty of Versailles set the stage for World War II, um, and eventually, you know, we'll get to that in a, in a few weeks.